Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Beth Webster, Director of the Centre for Transformative Innovation at Swinburne University. It's my pleasure today to introduce you to Mark Sullivan, Founder, Medicines Development for Global Health, and also the Clooney's Ross Entrepreneur of the Year uh, winner for 2020. Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather. For me, this is the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, uh, but I'd also like to pay my respects to the whole Aboriginal community who reside in Australia and who have been an integral part of its history. Mark Sullivan comes to Melbourne with a stellar background. He was previously a clinical program head at GSK in London, leading trials to test new drugs for HIV. Later, he worked at Gilead Sciences in California and on vaccines at the University of New South Wales. In 2005, he founded Medicines Development for Global Health. And this is a not-for-profit organization which is, uh, was founded to help solve neglected diseases affecting mostly people in the developing world. In the past, he's had significant wins with HIV and hepatitis B. He was the 2019 Victorian Australian of the Year for providing medicine to some of the world's poorest people. His organisation licences treatments and manages the development of drugs through to regulatory approval. Their first big success was a drug to treat river blindness. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Mark, who's going to discuss um, how he does it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Beth. Hi, everyone. Um, really nice to be talking to you again from home, um, not from tomorrow, but uh, for today at least, uh, still stuck at home. And uh, it's lovely to be able to at least have the opportunity to, to speak with you. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about our organisation, Medicines Development, and, uh, and what it is that we do. And I'm going to go into a little bit of the product development process, um, just so that you can see the context of, of the financing and the way that you finance these areas. So I'm going to start my screen share, and I hope that's um, uh, visible to everybody. Uh, so the, the topic is about financing the development of medicines for diseases of poverty, and I'll explain why that is a particularly challenging issue. Um, but uh, it is a, uh, a really important factor and a really, really important part to actually having the impact that we want to have. So um, we are going to talk today about why we do what we do. Um, we're going to talk about those financial challenges, about how we develop our medicines. And what is it that underpins those financial challenges? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the drug that we developed called moxidectin. And so as a sort of example of, um, of fundraising around a disease um, that is, uh, really affects people in sub-Saharan Africa who cannot afford to pay for their medicines, um, how did that work? Um, I'm going to focus in on social impact investments, that this is a really growing area and a really uh, important area for us to, um, to seek additional funding for the work that we want to do, and then what's in it for us um, coming up and our in the conclusion. So I want to just give this little bit of context about what a medicine does. And I think, uh, you know, had we been having this conversation in February of last year, probably would have felt a little less personal. But uh, we have experienced over the past 18 months, exactly what it's like to go through a pandemic where you don't have a vaccine and you don't have a treatment. And while for those of you who are younger, um, this is something that you could probably say, look, it's gonna to happen to older people. And you know, um, that's very unfortunate, but is it gonna to happen to me? Uh, until it becomes quite personal and it becomes your family members. And so when it becomes personal and it's your family members, it matters a great deal. So while a younger person for COVID is, is largely unaffected to, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, it is a, a very great concern to older people. And so the way that we manage those things, which now to you is obvious as a, an obvious thing, is uh, we use a vaccine to prevent the disease and we have a therapeutic to treat the disease. So with COVID, we don't really have a therapeutic yet, but they're coming. But we do have some really outstanding vaccines to prevent the disease or prevent the disease from progressing into its more severe form. Been other success stories, uh, as Beth mentioned, I worked on HIV and hepatitis uh, in my history, 
and um, more hepatitis B than C, to be frank. Um, so HIV used to be a disease when I started working on it that people died of uh, quite quickly. You had between two and five years from diagnosis to, uh, to put your affairs in order um, before you died. And now with the, the drugs and the improvements in treatments, this is a disease that people live from, live with. And with hepatitis C, it's a disease that uh, previously until actually fairly recently, probably the last seven or eight years, uh, was a disease that was absolutely uh, not preventable and uh, the treatments are very, very poor indeed. And now it, there's a great hope of eliminating this disease, certainly in Australia uh, and many other countries as well. So um, for those diseases that are in richer countries, such as the ones I just showed you, um, they occur in rich countries and poor countries. When there's a rich country opportunity, then um, they, it gets a lot more attention. Uh, for diseases of poorer countries, such as what, we, what are called neglected tropical diseases, uh, it is a, um, a real challenge. But, you know, nonetheless, they're people, they're our family, they happen to live in um, other parts of the world, and they also could benefit from improved treatments for the diseases that they suffer from. And the WHO has recognised that and published this statement, which talks about um, why it's important we deal with neglected tropical diseases, um, because really it's the linking of poverty and the disease that causes a, a, a sort of a spiral of, of um, disadvantage. And it, it really holds people back, holds them back from education and the opportunities that we've been incredibly lucky to enjoy in this country. But there are 20 different neglected tropical diseases. I won't go into uh, the names. All of them are quite horrible and you definitely don't want them. Um, they occur in uh, pretty much around the world, often in the equatorial belt around the world, and they affect, it's well over 1 billion people, it's closer to 2 billion people. And these diseases all hold people back uh, in their own countries. They don't necessarily kill you, uh, for example, uh, onchocerciasis, the disease that we'll talk about, which is also known as river blindness, doesn't necessarily kill you, but it certainly will greatly affect your life. So the financial challenge, you know, why don't we just tackle these diseases? Why don't we just sort them out? I mean, you know, they're a human family. Why can't we make this go well? So the real reason is that... Um, our world is divided into various income categories based on our gross domestic product. And most people live in low and middle income countries. So we are very fortunate again over here on the right in the high income country um, that we live. And, uh, and, but we are a rarity. You know, most people uh, don't have the advantages that we have. And when you look at where the medicines are made, the medicines are made for high income countries. Why is that the case? I'll explain it as we go through this, but it is the case. Um, everything that's to the left on this picture is really a kind of a hand-me-down from the work done for the high income countries. This isn't evil pharma. This isn't a, you know something uh, nefarious that's going on here. This is just pure economics. So in the upper middle income countries, they tend to rely on generics from the innovative stuff that's done on the right. Uh, and then there are second tier farmers, and I'd probably call us that as well. Um, you know, not the major big companies, but the groups who are very um, focused perhaps on some of the smaller diseases, the rarer diseases. Um, low income countries, they are really struggling to afford even basic medicine. So they tend to get second tier generics and sometimes when you're over on that side of the equation, the quality, um, it can be questionable. Uh, you do get the first tier pharmaceutical companies then beginning their donation programs into these areas. And the lower income countries, they cannot afford even basic medicines. Uh, and it's really only donors that they'll get their medicines from. This is a very complicated slide. But I just want to focus on this top part of this, which is how drugs are paid for. And this is for the economic side of the story, which is important to, to you as an audience. Um, for high income countries, a lot of our um, disease discoveries come out of academic research. We have a wonderful academic community uh, in this country and, um, and a lot of discoveries of uh, really interesting technology comes from here and all over the world out of academic research. 
but the development of them, the turning them into a product is done within the pharmaceutical industry. And I've called it the private pharma industry, but that's actually not accurate. Um, they're shareheld. So uh, almost all of them are shareholder organizations. So they're public companies and therefore you can own them and, uh, and have your stake in. But they do both development and manufacture. They make a drug, they sell it to people and that money allows you to continue the virtuous cycle. And everybody in those low middle income countries underneath this is either struggling with uh, you know, a, a, a fallout of the benefits of the, of the high income countries, or um, there are some nonprofit product development manufacturers and developers who are in the middle of uh, trying to make a difference here. But this is a struggle, this big box of 6.39 billion people. Uh, we're really not doing a great job with that group. Why is that the case? Why is this such a challenge? Well, most drug development doesn't work. So every time you hear somebody from, I won't pick on a university, but when somebody says, I've developed a new treatment for cancer and we've got some mice data, switch off at that point. Um, your chances of success with mouse data is um, one in a thousand, maybe one in 10,000. Uh, and you're in a, a test tube, it's one in a hundred thousand, that sort of range. We're talking incredibly unlikely to ever result in a new medicine. Once you get into the clinic, which is where our biotechnology industry and the pharmaceutical industry takes over, these are the chances of success. So going from phase one to two, 50% chance. Phase two to three, 28.9% chance. Phase three into actually submitting for registration, 50% chance. It's not good. You know, these are very low rates of success. And in fact, that's what the process is built to do. The process is here to filter out and kill off products quickly so that we can move on to the next thing. Because one clinical trial, phase one, will cost you $2 million without a blink. And that's not counting for all your in-house burn rate. I often torture this particular analogy, which is the aeronautical industry, talking about research, development, and then a regulatory process uh, over off into the commercialization of a product. If you're talking about the aircraft, it's really only Boeing and Airbus who do the product development, who turn that idea into a flying aircraft and they run trials and they they choose the interior fit out and but you know they're the ones who do that work and that's the same role as the pharmaceutical industry so that's pretty much what pharma does in the drug setting and it is as complicated as that and it's pretty much as expensive as that so pharma spends um, these are indeed billions of dollars so it's worth just making that sit for a second, 198, this is just pharma, $198 billion in 2020 was spent on R&D um, because it's incredibly expensive. And, uh, and if you carve that out into, well, how much was spent on neglected tropical diseases, that's the NTD there, um, that is all sources. That includes the Gates Foundation, that includes us, that includes everyone else. It's just under $4 billion is spent on that. And when you compare that to the population, two and a half billion people are in that NTD group and uh, 5.1 billion are without. So there's a massive mismatch here. Part of that is very detailed slide, but just this is the take home bit here, which you might be able to see, which is $2.8 billion to develop a drug. I know for certain that the out of pocket is less than that, by much less than that, uh, but it is still in the hundred to hundreds of millions of dollars out of pocket. We will write those checks for that much money to do the development of the product. Uh, and the result of all that expenditure over the past 10 years is there have been 947 non-innovative innovative products. So those are things that are reformulations or putting a couple of things together in the same tube. Uh, there have only been 314 genuinely innovative new products, of which 48 are for, neglect, uh, for infectious diseases and just 12 for neglected tropical diseases. It's a real mismatch. Why is that the case? Same old problem. People can't afford these drugs. 
So at the end of the day, they're not going to be able to pay you back for all that R&D expenditure that you just made. So what about moxidectin? Well, we work on a disease called river blindness and others now. River blindness, this is a statue in front of the World Health Organization. I took the picture, which I was very pleased with, um, to see this particular statue, which is a very famous one. It's of a child leading a blind adult, uh, which is a very used to be a very common scene in Africa uh, because the adult, by the time they're adult, will start to lose their eyesight, and so the child becomes the eyes of the adult. And when you're leading uh, a, an adult around like this, like the child is, they're not in school, they're missing out on the uh, opportunity for education. And uh, they'll also be looking at their future, which is uh, what has happened over time. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail of this. This is a worm that lives under the skin and it's transmitted by the bite of a fly. Um, the, the red band here on the, on the map of Africa is where the disease is endemic. 99% of the cases uh, are in sub-Saharan Africa, the poorest parts of the world. So it's not all bad news. There's been a fantastic drug called uh, ivermectin, which has been donated for over 30 years by Merck or MSD, as we call it in this country, a Merck in the United States. An incredible gesture of philanthropy from Merck. Uh, and a real problem for us. And I'll explain why that's the case. Their commitment, Merck's CEO committed to give as much of, uh, of ivermectin as is needed for as long as is needed, which is, again, incredibly generous. And so that drug is donated through what's called the Mectazan Donation Program, and they work very hard to donate um, ivermectin and get it into the field. This in the background here is a person with onchocerciasis who has uh, lost their eyesight. Uh, and I just want to make a little note. You probably have heard something in social media and in the media about ivermectin. No names, Chris Kelly. Uh, and, um, the, you know, this is a major, major issue for the community trying to deal with these two diseases, river blindness and lymphatic filariasis. Um, the ivermectin is getting taken from warehouses and being used to treat um, COVID. And I should put the air quotes around treat COVID. Um, this is a warning put out by the Mectazan donation program to say the drug does not work. You can't get the concentrations in a human that had the effect that were shown uh, in vitro from Monash. So um, that's been um, uh, shown in the large definitive studies. Uh, and unfortunately, there's lots of small studies full of bias that do not show that. So this is a consequence of one of those um, little press releases and um, alerts that go into the media where people are now um, having flare-ups of these diseases because they can't get at them. So ivermectin, fantastic drug, doesn't work for COVID, but uh, the discoverers of it won the Nobel Prize in 2015. So it's a very well-respected drug, but it doesn't work in all cases in the disease that we study. So we have been developing moxidectin uh, we picked it up in 2013, and this is and the reason why I'm showing this quite complicated slide is because of the economic aspects of this. They're very important because back here in the late 1990s, the World Health Organization said, actually, we could use, because ivermectin works really well, but not perfectly every time, we could use a second treatment. So they started to do the development of moxidectin, and they contacted the company who owned it, which is Wyeth. And Wyeth began working in a collaboration. But because ivermectin is donated in vast quantities, it's a real challenge making an argument to bring the second treatment into the field unless it's donated. Because you're then competing with a donated drug. Who's going to do that, even if the drug is better? So it's had a really tortured and difficult path and difficult life. Uh, we picked it up in 2014, and I'll go through some of the um, process that we've been through. Now, there's a, a paper, I'll put this in here just in case anyone is particularly interested in the science can see um, exactly how, how this drug works. But we put together the filing to the FDA. Um, you know, it is, it is a massive, massive undertaking. Uh, we had, I'll show you the number of people who were involved in the pre preparation of this. There are 70 data summaries. It's like each one of those is like a little PhD thesis. Um, 1,785 separate documents, 760 individual data sets, full data sets, 
Uh, we had 14 analytical assays that we had to develop and validate. We made 20 full scale batches under what's called GMP, which is the highest grade of manufacturing standards. And just for the phase three trial alone, there were 515,000 pages of raw data. We had a bunch of meetings. One of those meetings lasted 12 minutes and I flew to Washington for it for a 12 minute meeting, which uh, you know, in a, in a world um, that's warming up, I'm particularly ashamed of, but I needed to do it. So these are the people who are involved, vast numbers of people on the left, lots of companies on the right, you know, all of this is going to take uh, time and money. This is the approval letter. And there's a really important part of this, which is just down here. Uh, we've completed our review. This application has amended. It is approved, effective the date of this letter. So we received approval for this. And we became in the process the first Australian company to register uh, a novel medicine through the FDA on their own. It had never been done before. It doesn't matter if not-for-profit or for-profit. Not only that, we were the first not-for-profit in history to do that on our own worldwide. So it was quite a big deal. This is the prescribing information. This is very important to us in what we do because the prescribing information is the user guide. And it's a very heavily regulated document, it says everything you know about the drug. And in fact, if you are taking any treatments, you wanna know about the vaccines, anything you'd like to know, always look up the prescribing information. It tells you all the information that you'd ever wanna know and you can have a knowledgeable discussion with your doctor. Everything we know about our drugs goes in here. So when we got the approval, we got what was called a priority review voucher. And so um, we abbreviate that to a PRV. And a, pre a priority review voucher or a PRV is a voucher that the, uh, the US government provides the register of a drug, so the person registering the drug, in this case, it was us with moxidectin. We received a voucher for an accelerated review on our next drug, which, okay, great. Um, what does that mean? So a standard review of a drug takes, takes 10 months and a, an accelerated review is six months. So it's not that it's a shortened review or a lesser review, that's what I mean, shortened in terms of time, but not a lesser review. It's just done quicker. They put more people on it. Uh, and they do that for diseases that are particularly important. But they're also doing that because um, if, if you have a, a shortened time to market, that's actually worth quite a lot of money to the company. You know, these drugs often make billions of dollars. And if you save four months in that time to market, that's worth a lot of money to the company. So back to us, we received a voucher that entitles us on our next drug to have an expedited or an accelerated review. No use to us whatsoever, couldn't care less about that, but we're able to sell it. And we can sell it to a pharmaceutical company who can then use it on their next drug. And I know this is a bit weird, it's a Willy Wonka voucher, but the idea behind it is that it gives, the, uh, it gives a financial incentive to um, the company who buys it because they can accelerate the review of their next drug and get to market faster and make money quicker. So that means that we are able to sell this voucher and make a lot of money out of it. And that's what we did. So that's a really tough um, area. I've spent hours explaining what that is. Um, so we published on this. If you want to know a little bit about it as well, these slides will be available to you. Um, we published about how we're going to be using our priority review voucher proceeds. And we published this with the World Health Organization to explain uh, what we do. Uh, we sold our voucher to a company in Denmark called Nova Nordisk. Uh, we can't reveal how much we sold it for. The selling range of these vouchers is between 80 and 130 million US dollars. Uh, and so it was on the basis of that potential revenue that we were able to raise money in advance to do the work and all of that vast amount of documentation and pay all those people that I put up before. So the financing methods are um, really what we're sort of here to look at. How do you finance this stuff when you've got an incredibly expensive activity to do? You've got disease areas that are people who cannot afford to pay and therefore you're never getting your money back. How does it work? Well, priority review vouchers are a weird and as it turns out, pretty successful method. We also look for double bottom line opportunities, things where there are diseases that occur worldwide, 
scabies being one of them. Uh, we were particularly interested in moxidectin because it had a potential role for scabies. And scabies is, a, is, a, is an issue in our Aboriginal communities in a way that did not make sense to me and did not seem right to me. And so something that we wanted to do something about. So we wanted to look into why are the current treatments not working? Is there something we can do about? So we looked at moxidectin and we are currently in development on, on that basis. That's a double bottom line opportunity. There are rich people who have scabies. There are poor people who have scabies. And so we will charge the rich people uh, a lot of money for it. And we will provide the drug to poorer people who can't afford it. That's our model in a nutshell. Both of those elements provide an opportunity for social impact investing. Um, but also, you know, concurrent to any capital raising is uh, given the type of work that we do is to look for philanthropy. Uh, we still haven't taken a single donation from a philanthropist, um, but we do have a number of grants. So we've got grants from um, the European government, from the Gates Foundation, um, from WHO. We've got a number of uh, grants that we have working on at the moment. So for our priority review voucher, remember we were raising money against a potential voucher. And the other thing you gotta put in your mind is those success rates as you go through drug development, your chances of success are very low. So as we were trying to raise money, uh, we were trying to raise money early on with a lot of risk still ahead of us. And so we knew we needed about between 10 and 15 million US dollars. We raised 13 million from a group called the Global Health Investment Fund. We, we structured that as a tranche-based financing. We do that to protect ourselves as well as them so that we don't take all the money down. And then if we lose it, then uh, we have to struggle to pay it back or anything uh, untoward. We just want to be really clear on this. So we tranched up the, uh, the payments um, and uh, we repaid the capital. So we did sell our voucher, as you now know. Uh, we repaid the capital and an upside to Global Health Investment Fund. I can't reveal what that upside was. Uh, if you troll through their um, information, you'll probably be able to work out a fair amount of it, um, but they did really well. And uh, we were able to, with them, form a really nice partnership that has continued to this day. Uh, we have shared risks with them and they've added a lot of skills to our team. I am not a business person. I am a, a drug developer. Um, I'm a scientist. And, um, you know, as you've probably already been able to detect, I love to dive into data. Can't help myself. It's just the way it is. Uh, so to have some of the business acumen and, and talent that's come through the, uh, uh, the venture firm has been absolutely wonderful for us. It's been a really great um, experience. Uh, we sold our voucher using a bank uh, in Madison Avenue, New York, called Jefferies, uh, who do a lot of biotech investment. And as you know, it was to Nova Nordisk. Um, we found out as well, Nova Nordisk actually used that voucher for a diabetes drug. So they're able to use it on whatever they want. They're not constrained in any way. Our drug doesn't go with it. We keep our drug. They just get the voucher and they've used it on this particular product. So social impact investment, there are two of these social impact investments I just want to highlight. The one on the left is called Adjuvant Capital, and I'm a venture partner with them. And the one on the right is Global Health Funds, uh, which is a, I'm an investment advisor with them. Both are New York based and, uh, and both uh, have had either a history with the Gates Foundation or, uh, or a, a current, uh, Adjuvant has a current relationship with the Gates Foundation, hence the picture of Bill there. Uh, so um, I'll focus a little bit on the global health investment, which falls into the global health funds portfolio. And so their investments, there we are under 2015, um, but their investments have included a, a broad array of things, which have been vaccines, uh, therapeutics, such as ours, um, diagnostics, Atomo is an Australian company, uh, PATH, which is a, a Gates funded group out of um, Seattle, uh, Serum Institute of India, lots and lots of different areas, uh, but all areas where we're looking for an impact as well as a financial return. And they have done really well financially out of this. Uh, they made 12 investments and they've realised proceeds from seven of those already and they're still going. Uh, and again, I won't go into the detail of this in the interest of time, but just to say that you know, one of the measures is not just about how much cash they make out of this. Uh, which is really lovely for us. It's a very important part of why we have a good relationship with these groups because we're aligned. We're trying to make a difference in the world. Uh, and so they look for uh, impact on people's lives. You know, the, 
how many lives they've saved, how many lives they've improved. And that's one of the key measures for them in their success. And that goes on here. There's a bunch of things that they've worked on. And if you think about this was a 106 million US dollar fund to start with, it's gone on to be much bigger now. Um, and the a number of patients' lives or, that have been improved or saved is just uh, wonderful and rewarding. This is adjuvant capitalist portfolio. It's not to go through it with you, but they include a number of things like this one here, frontier nutrition, fortified snacks to address maternal and childhood malnutrition in Bangladesh, uh, through to some really interesting stuff on universals, which is a, uh, a manufacturing methodology for biologics, which is meant to make it more accessible and more easy for low and middle income countries to start manufacturing their own products. So what's next for us? Um, so there are a number of things that we are doing. So as I mentioned down here on the left, uh, we are in development moxidectin for scabies. We started a study uh, in Darwin, in France and in Vienna, which is just wrapping up now. And we're going on to full development on that next year. Uh, and also we've licensed in a drug from a company called Amgen. Amgen is one of the world's largest companies, let alone pharmaceutical companies. It's a very large pharma company, but it's also one of the world's largest companies. Uh, and they licensed a drug called AMG634 or uh, more catchily CC11050. We are working on a name for that. And uh, that's for the treatment of leprosy and tuberculosis and particularly leprosy um, where we're pretty much in uh, full development, this uh, complication of leprosy with this drug. But it's an immunomodulatory drug, so we think it could have a role in a number of other um, neglected diseases as well. And so that's what we're working for. Uh, at the moment. So it's wrapping up um, a fairly whirlwind tour of what it means to be a drug developer in a low middle income country um, disease area. There is a real balancing act that goes on here. This is an incredibly complicated work. And uh, I guess partly my skill set is in being a puppet master, if that doesn't sound too dodgy. Um, it's really trying to pull all of these pieces together. And a key part of that is making sure that we have the finances to do the work that we need to do. Um, but I also need to have the right skill set, and that's why we shop all over the world for people that we work with. Um, we buy those skills and we engage those people no matter where they are in the world. So early mornings and late nights are very much part of what we do. Um, what we do is, as I said, incredibly complicated and uh, you know, you're driven by the data. So you're learning all the time, you generate data and you respond to that data. So it's like, you know, building an aircraft, except you don't know that if you put a particular carpet in, whether or not the, uh, you're going to bring the plane down. So you have to really work this stuff through and be very careful in responding to the data you generate. So that's the science aspect of this. It underpins everything that we do. And it really doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. In our world, the only person that matters is a regulator. Um, we tend not to worry about peer-reviewed publications. People go on and on and on about, oh, it's peer-reviewed, it's peer-reviewed couldn't care less about peer review. Regulators are the ones who make the difference. They're the ones who judge whether or not we've actually done what we said we did. They will go into each individual raw piece of data all the way down to the clinic and they will review it. And they put a team of between 50 and 100 people on reviewing a product, that's peer review. So we focus on regulatory um, processes. And we do all of this for this person who I've never met, who will never know my name, um, and we do it because this person uh, suffers from a condition that we should be able to treat. There are lots and lots of conditions like this that should be manageable if we just had the resources, the skill set, the money, and the ability to manage all of this to, um, to address these diseases and improve people's lives. I don't care where they are. I don't care how much they can afford to pay. I just need to find a way to do it. And so that's what we, we do. So on that note, I will say thank you for your kind attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Great, well, thank you um, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. That was fantastic and, and just an amazing journey. Can I ask people um, uh, if they want to ask Mark a question to put it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your computer and I'll read it out. I know there's some comments in the chat, which I'll have a look at as, as well. But can I just start with a question? Mark, you talked about there was a first drug, Ivydectin. Ivymectin. Yeah. Ivymectin, and then you replaced it with Moxidectin. Yes. Why, why did you do that? What, 
did the first drug not work properly or what was the issue? It works, it works pretty well. In fact, yeah. it works very well, but it doesn't work well in everybody. So there's still a number of people who will take the drug and not respond as you would like them to. Uh, that's about a third of patients who don't respond in the way that you would want. So the, the field decided way, way, way back to look in the same family, hence the, the Decton's end of things. There's a class of drugs called macrocyclic lactones, of which there are, I think, about nine, eight or nine. Ivermectin and moxidectin are both from the same family. Moxidectin has got slightly different characteristics and is slightly more effective than ivermectin. So it's looking to improve on what ivermectin is already good at. Right. Okay, so there's a question here from JM. Um, last year, we were told that we might not even get a single effective COVID-19 vaccine because most clinical trials fail. Yet a few failed, but the vac vac vaccine after vaccine seemed to pass trials and be declared effective. What happened to make what happened to make that happen? It's the disease. It's not the vaccines. It's the disease. Turns out that um, SARS-CoV-2 is very amenable to vaccination. So we've been working on HIV vaccines for I've been working on them since uh, 2000. Um, it's it is a, a a disease that is not tractable to to vaccines certainly not at the moment. We hope that that will change one day. It's essentially how your body responds to the antigens that it's presented, which is the virus that it sees. When it sees the virus, it develops antibodies and it develops a, 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 an immune response to it. And if that virus is able to morph under that immune response, you're not, it's not going to make any difference to you. You're going to still be infected. SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, is amenable to vaccination doesn't twist very easily under the immune pressure. And so we were able to develop the vaccines for it. Um, so it's not just, you know, trials in vaccines fail. That's not quite accurate. It's that vaccines fail. We have, this is now the 30th disease only that we've been able to develop a vaccine for. Some diseases are really easy to get a vaccine for. Others are incredibly difficult. And turns out SARS-CoV-2 is quite easy to get a vaccine for. So we're incredibly lucky. Very lucky. Could have been so lucky. In fact, mm. I'm on the Commonwealth Government's committee advising on vaccines. And the first thing I said to them is, be prepared. I doubt we'll get a vaccine. So I'm, I'm so pleased we're wrong. Mm. Okay, question from Bruce Verity. Does MDGH manufacture the drugs itself or do you use contract manufacturers? And if you use contract manufacturers, do you have multiple manufacturers to decrease the business risk? Yeah, so Great question, Bruce. Um, we do have contract manufacturers. Uh, we do have multiples of those, but because you have to qualify each of the manufacturers, we do have a sort of a backup, but um, you really have to invest in that manufacturer. So we, we have a FDA, US FDA approved manufacturer in China who makes the raw ingredient. We uh, ship it to Switzerland where it's milled. We then ship it to the United States where it's turned into the tablets. Uh, and we do have a backup for the, um, the raw ingredient, but it's really hard for us to get a backup for the other aspects. So at the moment, um, it's all contract and, uh, and there is an element of risk there for sure. John Webb says, great work. How many people are involved in the company here in Australia? Yes, yeah, there's 20 of us here in Australia. So we're still very small. Um, and we have uh, we have probably 50 people who are on active contract with us um, around the world. So the 20 people really coordinate quite a lot of a lot of people. That's how we, we generally run things. Do you want to just describe how you first started and, and you sort of went from more of a virtual business yeah. to a, yeah? Yeah, we, we started, um, you know, we knew that the core element of, of drug development is the, is the coordination that I really need another term than puppet master. Um, but, you know, the, the person who is uh, in the middle pulling it together, which is really what I've done in my career, I started in a very junior role and moved into that position where I now, when I pull it all together. And so we knew that was important. That's what we focused on. So we had the, the bit in the middle, but we didn't have any of the expertise around the table that we needed. So we would buy that um, virtually and had a very small group in-house. 
But when we started to um, do this moxidectin program, we knew we needed to add to that team and have our own expertise in house as well as the external. So that's how we did it. So we transitioned after about five years or so to begin to build that expertise in house uh, more so and more so. And now we are really structured as pretty much any pharma company does. Although with 20 people, it's uh, it's tiny. Let's let's be honest. So Tom Sperling has asked, does moxidectin work in all cases or is IV mectin still needed? Uh, it does work in all cases. Um, IV mectin will still have a role and will, will be important um, for probably ever. IV mectin works really well in so many cases that although moxidectin is generally superior, that's a term we use from a clinical trial perspective statistically, um, so in onchocerciasis, it is superior to ivermectin. It doesn't mean there is no role for ivermectin. There absolutely is a role for ivermectin, uh, as there is a role for moxidectin. We think the two drugs will work quite well in companionship with each other. That's how we see it going. So is the, um, in terms of the rollout, do you just go and vaccinate a whole population in South Africa? In, in Africa? Sub -Saharan Africa? Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a treatment. So um, So it's... So what they do because of the, the remote locations and the, you know, really the only interaction with the healthcare system that people get is when the NGO or the WHO truck arrives in the village, usually once a year. And so then treatment is handed out to the, to the community and that's how it's done. So it's called mass drug administration, which is, um, is how these drugs are distributed. So they treat the entire community because everyone is at risk or either has the disease or is at risk of it. So they treat the whole community and that's how they would do this as well. What age do they start? start usually at the age of five. From five up, okay. Yeah. Okay, Andrew Brock, uh, his surname's missing, said, amazing presentation, thanks, Mark. Um, can Mark add any further details on the upcoming areas of focus, i.e. are there any new collaborations about with Amgen for TB or leprosy? Yeah, look, the, the, um, so a new compound, uh, the catchy one, CC11050. Uh, so we're developing that for leprosy type 2 reaction and uh, for TB. So adjunct therapy for TB. So it works alongside of the antimicrobials to stop the immune system damaging the lungs. Um, so there's been an initial study that's funded by the Gates Foundation conducted by the Orem Institute in South Africa uh, that's been published. And, uh, and they're now embarking on a much larger study looking at how, how our drug can work alongside of current therapies for TB. Um, so that study is, uh, it's COVID delayed. Most things that are not COVID are COVID delayed. Um, so we are indeed COVID delayed with that one, but that's a collaboration with the Orem Institute in South Africa. Uh, and, um, and Amgen have been fantastic to us. They have gifted us this drug and they've provided some funding to help with manufacture and the trials. So they've been absolutely superb to us. Um, for leprosy type two reaction, we're working with um, a group called the Leprosy Mission. They're based in uh, London and, and in the US, but uh, work a lot in Nepal. And so we've got a trial that's um, about to start in Nepal. But uh, again, that clinic has been converted into a COVID clinic. Uh, and so we're waiting for that to, to move now to be back to being a, uh, a leprosy clinic. And, um, and so we're, we're also setting up a, some collaborations with some other groups um, uh, in London and France on, on that as well. So look, we're really, we're really collaborative in the way that we work. We find that's the best way to go. And I haven't mentioned the other things that moxidectin is being used for. I mentioned scabies, but there are four other neglected diseases that we're in full development for. So there's a lot going on. Simon Wilkins has asked, can you explain the role of orphan drug indications in MD's strategy going forward? Um, we tend not to worry so much whether it's orphan or it's really useful that it is orphan. Um, there are some advantages in, in diseases being orphan and disadvantages in that. So uh, orphan, for those who, who don't know, uh, the US defines it as less than 200,000 people in the United States. So uh, you get some regulatory advantages, you get more interaction, you don't have to pay the full fees for dealing with the regulator. So there's some real advantages in that. Um, the way that we tend to look at drugs is, and diseases is drug first, disease second, which sounds a bit perverse, 
but you know you you might want to solve i see someone's made a note there about dengue uh, you might want to solve dengue fever but if you do want to solve dengue fever, then you go and look to see what drugs are out there that could be used to treat it or what vaccines are available to prevent it. And uh, that leaves you with whatever's available. Whereas it's the drug that will make and break your success. You can't change the characteristics of a drug. They're fixed in physics and they're unchangeable. All you need to do is to characterise what that drug looks like, what it does to the body, what its safety profile is, what its efficacy profile is. So it's the drug that will make or break your success. So we tend to look at drug first and then whether the diseases it treats are in our area of interest. And so that's how we've ended up with moxidectin and it's also how we, we have looked into the um, CC11050 as a, as a possibility. Great drug uh, and also happens to work in diseases of interest for us. Okay, so Errol Harvey has asked, you mentioned the perverse effects of mass donate, donation drugs and well done for finding an alternative way. Are there lessons from your experience that can be generalised to other diseases? So, so was your puppet mastery a unique situation? Yeah, um, yeah look, it, it, it isn't that unique. I think the way that we approach things is pretty common. I think we are a lot more nimble. You know, I, I worked at, uh, at GSK in London and um, it was a fantastic organisation and I am very proud of what I did there and I'm very proud of, of that experience. Um, it's 110,000 employees working on 120 different compounds. So, you know, it's a machinery for doing product development and it's, you learn a great deal in that experience. So I learned from that and apply that. It doesn't necessarily change uh, depending on where you are, you've still got to go through the same eye of the needle with the regulator that, that you do at GSK or that we do. Um, but I think we're able to be a lot more nimble in what we do and the way that we approach things. Big companies tend to outsource everything and often without uh, as much opportunity to question what they outsource, whereas we are a lot more uh, careful about what we outsource and what we conduct ourselves and manage ourselves. And that can be a lot more efficient for us, but it also means that the knowledge stays with us. If you outsource and that's all you do, the knowledge is with them. Um, I like the knowledge to be with us. So I think that there are some learnings that could be applied to other disease areas. And we're happy to do that as well. We are happy to apply our, our skill set to any area of interest. Um, we're particularly passionate about infectious diseases, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, question from Jeremy Drake. Hi, Mark, that was very interesting. Thanks. I missed the start, sorry. You may have explained this already. <laughs> Did you start with the invention and construct the NFP company around that with social impact in mind? Or the NFP social impact company came first and you took on Moxidectin to develop? Yeah, it's the latter. We set up the company. I wanted to, um, to do what I've always done all my career, uh, but to do it for diseases that were perhaps being left behind, being ignored. Uh, and so I established the not-for-profit first, and then we looked for intellectual property to, to bring in. And uh, we established the company in 2005, but we didn't bring in Moxidectin 2000, until 2014. So there was a period of time there, we worked on a number of different products, different areas. Uh, we did some consulting to keep the doors open and the finances coming in uh, while we were looking for that opportunity. So that was the, that was the model that we pursued. We knew it was the right idea, but just didn't have the right product at the time. Yeah, and you're quite patient, obviously. Yes. Uh, so Suzanne Sperber has uh, said, inspirational talk. What is the biggest challenge for the organisation? Um, time, money, money. <laughs> usual things. Um, you know, it, it's, it's making sure that um, you understand where you start and stop. So, you know, a lot of you have... Uh, finance, economic, um, business acumen that I, I would be happy to say I don't have. And so uh, it's knowing where your skill set is and drawing the line where that stops. And so I, I know how to do that. I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at and getting in that right expertise. So, you know, we've got a fantastic board. Uh, I do have those relationships with the groups in New York to um, help me with some of the business side of things. I could pick up the phone to people and ask them what the heck is a mezzanine round. You know, I can work through those things uh, quite well. 
Um, so I think that from that side, I feel confident. It's always though, a constant battle of raising money to do the work that we do. And it's the availability of time and resources. You never have enough resources. You never have enough time. And, uh, and that's just a constant battle. But I have to say, we have really exciting stuff. You know, I, I love science. I love digging into individual bits of data. And I get that in my job. And there are times when I'm presenting in front of the WHO uh, and think, how did I get here? This is a wonderful opportunity. Um, so you do big picture and small picture. Um, and, uh, and so the, the downside of worrying about the cash and where that's coming from is counted with uh, some of the impact things that you get to do, which is uh, wonderful. And a question from me. So one of the things I keep hearing when I occasionally dabble in the big pharma area is that it's becoming harder and harder to get effective drugs. It's becoming more and more expensive and people are looking to, I don't know, biologics and all, all sorts of different areas with different science bases. Is that true? Has that changed? Is that, I mean, and, and why is that so? The big block, the big uh, blockbuster drugs, they say, are coming off patent and we've got nothing to replace them with. It's... I think that's always a challenge. I think yeah. I, I don't think it's fair to draw farmers into this, but it is a little bit like, you know, when will it rain? When will it stop raining? You know, it, it's, it, it seems as though the ecosystem for high-income countries works reasonably well still, even though there are constant challenges of coming up with the next big thing. Um, so that is a that is an issue. Drugs are more expensive to develop, but you know things like uh, we've been forced into this because it's affected us all. The mRNA vaccines are an extraordinary step forward and a really exciting opportunity. I mean, I, I do some vaccine work um, advisorily, and uh, it's an incredibly interesting area. Uh, the mRNA vaccines have been an amazing step forward. And you then wonder what else could it be that technology be used for? One of the things that from JM who asked the question about the vaccine, will we even get one? Um, yeah, you know, one of the reasons that vaccines struggle with particularly diseases like common cold, um, coronavirus, it's uh, because they affect the mucosa. So the antibodies circulate in the blood, not in the mucosa. So you get infected in the in the epithelial lining uh, of your respiratory system. And uh, by the time you're infected, the antibodies can't get to where they need to be. But if you can present a, um, a method of actually improving the mucosal immune system, that's just a, a wonderful step forward. And the mRNA vaccines seem to be able to do that. It's something that's been the holy grail in vaccinology for a long time. So I'm really excited by things like that that come from left field or that have been hovering in the background that suddenly turn out to be very encouraging and and uh, and. and maybe are the next big thing. So it's almost as though there's a new trajectory going on in, yeah. in that, that vaccine research. Yeah. Um, so I think, look, we've come pretty much to the end of the talk. Um, unless anyone has another question. Um, I maybe just want to comment on that, uh, the dengue fever one. It, it oh, is yes. on the list, but it's not yeah. something that we are working on, only because the, the right agent hasn't crossed our, our desk. And, right. uh, and we tend to work on things that are later in development for those risk reasons that I mentioned before, those, those little bar graphs, we tend to pick things later on. Um, so we just haven't seen the right thing for dengue. Mm. It's an area of interest um, for us because it's obviously locally of interest as well. Yeah. So on behalf of everyone here, Mark, thank you very much for, it's a really stimulating and, and uplifting talk. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we need uplifting talks. We do. We all need something. <laughs> and we need we need good news, um, and I think good news might be coming uh, to us slowly. Um, and I really appreciate your time. And congratulations again on being the uh, Clooney's Ross Entrepreneur of the Year. Thank you. It's a lovely honour. So thank you. Yeah. That's so um, I don't know. We can cl clap. No. Um, not really. That's okay. That's only a hand that up. Free is not necessary. It was just um, thank you all for for being there. It's um, uh, great that you spent the time. Okay, to, uh, and, and I'll email you afterwards. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. Thanks, Bye. everyone.